Since the dawn of time, man has been looking toward the sky, watching the birds soar overhead, and thinking, I want to do that. And for centuries, man has been attempting to imitate the birds. Early efforts were human-powered designs that typically involved attaching wing-like structures to one's arms and legs and then hurling oneself off a building. <coughs> These efforts were unsuccessful, not to mention painful. Later efforts included a wide variety of mechanically driven designs. Some had familiar bird-like features. Some bordered on the artistic. Some were just downright amusing. But none got off the ground. And then one chilly day in December 1903 on a beach at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the brothers Orville and Wilbur Wright finally made it work. Their flimsy-looking biplane left the ground and stayed aloft for twelve whole seconds. By their fourth and final flight of the day, they stayed up for fifty-nine seconds and flew eight hundred and fifty-two feet. So, how did they finally do it? Well, the Wright brothers figured out that the way to overcome gravity was not by flapping or hopping their way off the ground, but rather by creating a design that had a large, fixed wing. Then, they needed to provide enough forward motion that this fixed wing could create lift. The way it works can be explained by Daniel Bernoulli and Isaac Newton. Bernoulli found that as fluid flows through a venturi, the velocity of the fluid at the narrow throat section increases and its pressure decreases. You can kind of picture an airplane wing, with its curved upper surface, as being similar to the bottom half of a venturi. And like a venturi, as the air flows over the curved surface, its velocity increases and its pressure decreases. Since the pressure above the wing is decreased relative to the pressure below the wing, lift is created. In addition, Newton's third law states that any action must have an equal and opposite reaction. As the air flows down over the trailing edge of the wing, it creates a downward force. This downward force must be offset by an equal and opposite upward force, which is lift. Take that, gravity! So anyway, once the Wright brothers figured it out, things really started to take off, so to speak. Advances in aviation came quickly. World War I saw the first airplanes in combat, though these planes were more likely to fall out of the sky due to mechanical failure than they were to shoot down an enemy. After the war, many of the pilots kept their flying dreams alive by joining the new airmail program. Still others became involved in air races and barnstorming shows. It was still hard for the average person to comprehend that flying was really possible, and yet here were amazing displays of wing-walking and aerobatics. The crowds were always large when the airplanes were in town. People would come from miles around to see these amazing machines and their larger-than-life pilots. As the planes became more powerful and dependable, endurance flying really became popular. The world cheered and ticker tape parades were held in celebration of Charles Lindbergh's amazing feat of being the first to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. And the world mourned when in her quest to become the first to circumnavigate the globe, Amelia Earhart was lost over the South Pacific, never to return home again. The achievements and advances in aviation during the World War II years were incredible. There were quick and agile fighter planes, a wide assortment of bombers, and near the end of the war the Germans became the first to successfully develop jet-powered airplanes. The first airlines were created as far back as the 1930s, but the war efforts delayed progress in civilian aviation for a while. But the time of growth and prosperity after the war made airline travel more affordable and accessible to even the average family. Fast forward now to the 21st century, where millions of people around the world fly to destinations near and far every single day. To many, flying has become an annoying series of busy airline terminals, endless security lines, bad airplane food, and lost luggage. And just like many other technological achievements, man has learned to use aviation for good purposes and for evil. If the early dreamers could see the state of aviation now, I am sure they would be amazed. But they might be a bit saddened, too, because there's not much magic to it anymore. Sure, the science can tell you how we fly, but the early dreamers could tell you why. They knew what the birds have always known, that whether it's early in the morning or near the sunset of the day, there's nothing quite like the excitement, the freedom, and the peace you can find at just a few thousand feet above the ground. Mm -hmm.